Um, the paper cutter. I want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. It is a spectacular day, and as we know, when we get a day like this in Milwaukee Spring, we feel like we need to be outside. So thanks for coming in for just a little bit. For some of you, this story is incredibly familiar. I know I have a whole crew of docents who probably presented this numerous times. We have a producer who spent hours upon hours creating and curating her perspective on this story. And you know, but if you're anything like me, it's the type of story that you can come back to again and again and again, and you don't get tired of it. And then there are also some of you here who are here today that this is new, and I hope that you gain an appreciation of the process that we went through in creating this exhibit. Um, and, and it'll give you a sense of what we have. And as we said, this is a traveling exhibit, so if you know places where it should be, <coughs> let us know if we would be delighted to get there. You know those places where it should be. I'm going to interrupt you because someday Jay and I were talking with some fellows who were in Milwaukee from LA, mm -hmm. and they threw in several $20 bills into a jug because it was a free day, and they thought this was an opportunity. My point is, they were very impressed with our museum, mm -hmm. and they have the Simon uh, Wiesenthal out there. Museum of Tolerance. Right, but um, they go to a different city every year, and they chose Milwaukee, not because any of them had any connections here, they just came here, and they were very impressed with the museum, so that might be a, a location to, to consider. Okay. So what you're going to see today, this is basically the talk that I gave at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. And do, during a two-day period, I had the privilege of training their gallery educators, that's what they call their docents, <laughs> <laughs> talking with visitors in the gallery, and then I delivered this speech as well. And I was thrilled that several Milwaukeeans were able to join me. It made me feel a little bit less homesick in that quick, crazy couple of days. And, and so it was really nice to have that home base there. I also have to thank my colleagues who are here today but weren't able to go to New York. Because I don't know if any of you understand just how much work it takes to get an exhibit on the road. You know, there are contracts that you have to go over, and that contract process is a back and forth. Patty is shaking her head in absolute bliss. It's like this, no, no, I want this comma here, and that kind of thing. We had to take pictures of every single element of everything in the exhibit and, and make sure that there was, uh, there was a condition report on every dress, every shoe, every uh, mannequin. Just imagine that we could say this nose has one little scratch right here. Like that is how specific this needs to be so that we know how the condition is moving forward. Um, and then there's the whole process of packing and shipping and getting it out. And everybody, Molly, Jay, Patty, uh, Hannah, Lindsay, all of our staff were really engaged in this process. And this was the first time we've ever undertaken something like this. So it's a pretty big deal. And I just want you guys to get a sense of the enormity of what was accomplished. I also have to thank, I have to give a shout out to Tiff Kua, who's here today. Tiff, She is the producer of the arts page. And the arts page created a 22-minute documentary uh, of this exhibit. It's available to see online. Um, you can find it at our stitchinghistory.org website. And it's beautiful, and it does an amazing, amazing job of capturing much of what I'm going to be talking about here. And it was actually, it received the Emmy for Best Short Form Documentary. Um, it was in the arts category, Best Special for Arts. Best special for arts, and that is regional. So it was, you know, it was up against things that had been produced in Chicago and in Indianapolis and all over the Midwest. Ours, this piece, which I'm claiming is ours, but it's really hers, was the winner at the uh, regional Emmy. So it's a pretty big deal as well. And this will end the portion of my speech that is like an Oscar acceptance speech. And now I'm going <laughs> to so, privilege challenge undertaking of having to clean out a parent or loved one's home as they moved into assisted living or skilled care for whatever reason. Yeah? yeah? In my experience, you're confronted with boxes, some of which are labeled, many of which are not, and at some point most of us in the universe get fed up and say, that's it, I'm just going to call 1-800-JUNK. This was not the case for Birch Trinata. As Birch Trinod was helping his mother relocate to an assisted living facility, moving her out of a house in Fox Point that she'd lived in for decades, he did not take the path of least resistance. He looked through everything, and during this meticulous process, he found the first pieces of this exhibit. One letter, two envelopes, 
and eight dress designs, with one small photo addressed to his father in beautiful handwriting. And for some of you, you know these well. He was taken aback by the swastika on the back of one of the envelopes, and more so in learning of his father's involvement in this story. By this time, in 1998, Bert's dad had been gone for three decades, and he never heard of any of these people. Um, also included were these eight beautiful dress designs. Each one is perfectly designed for their time, but pretty timeless as well. I know when the exhibit was up, many of us had, well, this is the one that I would want to wear. This is my dress. This is the one that I'm connected to. Just imagine if you ran across these pieces. Here's the letter that he found. And you can see how beautiful his handwriting is. And it's dated December 1939. World War II had been raging for about three months. But if you're a Jew living in Czechoslovakia, your life had been impacted since the Munich Agreement was signed um, in October of 1938. And I'm going to ask you to hold on to that date, October 1938, because it's going to come back later. Here's what this letter says. I received your last letter and thank you very much for your kind care. I was very glad to hear that you were troubling to get an affidavit of necessity for my wife as a dress designer. Would you be so kind as to let me know if you've had any success in this matter? You may imagine that we have great interest of leaving Europe as soon as possible because there is no possibility of getting a position in this country. By separate mail, I sent you some dress designs my wife made. And then he goes on to talk about how his family is doing well and they've all lost their jobs and he's helping his wife in shaping artificial leather flowers, uh, artificial leather and silk flowers. And then he asks for a fashion journal, which is such a mundane detail because they can't get them from Paris anymore. You know, there's a lot going on. He ends his letter saying, uh, I can't send you the new stamps from Bohemia because we're not allowed to send those. So you have a sense that maybe these are people that are connected and interacted. He ends interacting on a regular basis. He ends his letter, I remain with kind regards to you and your wife and with best wishes for the new year. You know, it's such a quiet letter. It's so nuanced and it's so subtle. And that was to get through the censor. The swastika on the back was on the back of the envelope that this letter came in. He needs to make sure that, the, that this gets through and he needs to make sure they understand that that the cousins who receive it understand that the family's at risk, but on the flip side, he needs them to understand also uh, that, that, that he needs the censor to read it as just a mundane sort of everyday letter. I think we can amplify it further if you, if you need it. If so does you know, stop so. yelling. It'll be, it'll be nice for me. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Sure. Candy. Oh, I, you know, it doesn't sound any different. It doesn't sound any different. It's there like, you know. okay, now? Yeah. 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 Okay, well and now I can be a little less like, hello. <laughs> um, you know, and I think one of the important details is these are not distant cousins. They're first cousins and they've been in contact. You know, the stamp detail, the kind of back and forth on this is what's going on with my family. He never introduces his wife's name, says something about the nature of the relationship, that you're not, you know, doing this last minute desperate, you're, you're talking to someone you know. These pieces were turned over to Jewish Museum Milwaukee's founding director, Kathy Bernstein, who many of you know, before we were created as a museum. And our initial consideration was preservation. When JMM opened to the public in 2008, and this should look very familiar, uh, for those of you who were part of the creation of this museum, you know how much work went into create this project. And then all of a sudden, everything's on display and every typo is out there, and everything that's not included is on there, and all the people are coming forward and saying things like, where is my grandmother's tablecloth? What did you do? How come you don't have this story? Don't you understand this is the most important thing to Jewish Milwaukee, and you do not include it, and you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. We've just opened a museum. One such visitor was my mother. After touring the museum and seeing the dress designs, she said, you could do so much more with those dress design, those dresses. And like any frustrated museum worker slash daughter, my response was, really? Like what? And her response was, you can make them. And this was the beginning of a process that crossed oceans and took five years of research connecting people unknown to each other. Our first course of action was finding the nameless dress designer in Paul Strenaud's letters. And as a researcher with limited funds, my first stop was the internet. 
I started by going to Yad Vashem's names database. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. Yad Vashem is the largest is the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and they embarked on a project many, many decades ago to try and give names to every person who died in the Holocaust, so that you would submit a page of testimony, and this would then document who was part of that, uh, who, who, where they died, where they lived, what their occupation was, if they had spouses and parents and all of those things, to try and reconstruct the names of the people. It's an amazing resource, and more amazingly for me, it's all digitized at this point, which means that I can access it from Milwaukee and, and have that same information at my fingertips, and I don't have to go to Jerusalem to get into their database. So, these were some of the major questions that we started grappling with as we started this research. Who are these people? Was she a professional? And what happened to them? That, that was what we didn't know before. And as we turned over, this is what Gad Vashem's name's database looks like today. It's actually much nicer looking than it looked like when I started this research in 2010. Uh, and it's much easier to use. They've, they've streamlined the process a lot. And so if you type in Paul Stranod into the name thing, you get exactly one Paul Stranod. And in my memory of this task, it was entirely, it was way more Herculean than this. My memory of this is that there were 10 Paul Stranods, and they were from all over Czechoslovakia, and I had to look for one address that matched the address on the envelope, and then I could correspond that his wife's occupation was dressmaker, and ta-da, I found Paul Stranod. In reality, there's one Paul Stranod. So sometimes your memory makes, makes things even harder. You know, you're gonna be even more impressive. But it's still amazing that I could locate this guy, and that's all because of this initiative started by this museum in Israel. If you click on Paul Stranod, you're able to cross-reference through the system and find his wife. And in clicking this, we were able to discover uh, that you know, our designer is no longer nameless. I'm pleased to introduce, and it's not a first introduction for most of you, Hedvika Anshurl Stranod, whose profession is listed, this is Hedvika, and her profession is listed as Lady Taylor. This testimony was submitted by Brigitte Newman Rowicek, and in total, she submitted nine pages of testimony for family members, including her mother, her grandparents, her cousin, um, all of her aunts, uh, and, and her uncle. And this is this is you, you know you can't even imagine what that's like. And it gives you a sense of how old this documentation is because if you look and let's see if my is my razor laser going to work. You can see the address there is West Germany. So we know that this document was done before 1989. So it gives you, I'm looking at this in 2010, and we know that at some point prior to 1989, there was a niece, a living niece in Nuremberg. So finding Brigitte became my new mission. In my mind, she would answer every conceivable question. But as someone looking for this information in 2010, I wasn't even sure that she was still living. Again. The internet is unbelievable. If you Google Brigitte today, you will find endless sources about this exhibit. And there are pages upon pages that show up. If you Googled Brigitte in 2010, there was exactly one internet leak that showed up. And it was for the appendix of a book called Kinder Transport and Trauma. And it was written by an academic in Germany. And I emailed a publisher who happened to be in Britain. And this was her response to me. Dear Ellie, I'm terribly sorry, but it was in early 2001 that I contacted Mrs. Rowicek by phone and spoke to her only once. So I'm afraid I have not got her number anymore, nor do I remember where she lives. I will look through some of my old address books, though, and if I find an entry, entry under Miss Rowicek's name, I will let you know. Best wishes, Iris. So that was my dead end for a while. And the next three years or so, if anyone said, oh, I have a contact in Berlin, or I'm planning a trip to Germany, or I'm going to be adjacent to Germany, and then I would say to them, hey, can you see if you can find this phone number? Can you find some information for this lady? Thinking that maybe someday it would come in. Who knew? Meanwhile, we started creating the dresses. We were exploring the best way to create these dresses. We talked to design programs at universities, we talked to local seamstresses, we tried to connect with national outfits, and we couldn't find anyone willing to take on this challenge. In the fall of 2012, JMM hosted a lecture. Um, it was the first rehearsal for the Diary of Anne Frank um, that was being produced by the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Kath 
Kathy sidled up to their costume director, you can imagine what that conversation looked like, <laughs> and said, I have a project for you. The costume director was intrigued by the project and took it on as a project during her staff's furlough periods in the winter and summer. Because the rep produces amazing costumes for 11 to 13 shows a year, but they have periods in which they're not producing for the rep, and so that's when they take on contract work. And this was, I will say, a much larger undertaking than their usual productions, their usual furlough things. This image that you see here is a picture of their inspiration wall. And I think if you saw this in like a psychopath's house, you'd be like, wow, there's a lot going on there. But really is, the, in the center, I'm just gonna give you kind of a quick rundown on how this is working. These are the images of the pieces, of the dresses themselves, and going out from each line are the things that are inspiring them in their recreation. So there is this really organized process that's on display here. So like everything that you see on this line is related to this aqua dress. And it's, it's kind of an amazing, it was one of those things that you walked in and saw it and you were like, oh, they really understand what, what, what head is under where that arm is. There's no representation of that. How do you figure out what's going on there? Nothing. The first thing they said to us, they were like, we're like, here are some dress designs, make them. And they're like, we thought this was so obvious and easy. And immediately, we come into our first meeting, and Molly, of course, will remember this, and they're like, well, you know there are no backs to the dresses. We're like, oh, backs to dresses, yes. <laughs> Three dimensions versus two, crazy. It was like a mind-blowing uh, meeting. They didn't know the materials, and they had no idea what she intended with certain fabrications. Take this purple coat. You see those diamond insets there? Are those a different fabric? Is it some sort of specific fabrication? How, you know, every single detail on that is going to be a work of interpretation, and they needed to figure out what the appropriate interpretation was. They began their process by pulling similar dresses from their costume archive, and they went to, and this is actually what that looks like in production. They went to Mount Mary University, which has a historic, uh, and Mount Mary is local, has a historic costume collection of over 9,000 pieces, so they pulled things that were reflective, and they too utilized the internet as well. And this is actually, I don't know if any of you guys are Pinterest people, anybody? Pinterest people are very active in their Pinteresting, and they, and this is something that I find that costume designers all over are using for their inspiration as a way of keeping it all in one place. So if you're really interested in the exhibit, you can go online and you can Google Jessica Yeager, who is our project uh, lead, and this is her Hedvika uh, thing. And everything going down here has information about the exhibit, but it also has things like this. This is a Sears and Roebuck dress pattern from 1938. And if you look at those floral dresses and the way those, they really match up in some ways and look very similar to the day dresses that Hetty was drawing. So this was a way of understanding, okay, that's how you're doing a back on these dresses. That's how these sleeves are connected because they can look at patterns from the same time and get this understanding. But this, the amazing thing for me as a, as a researcher is that they kept all their research in this very organized fashion so I can now see it and, and use it with you guys here and use it to show all of these connections. Um, so and this also tracks all the fabrics they used, all the zippers, every shoe, all of that. And each, you know, each, each um, detail really focused in on something they had to have in the way that if you're doing an exhibit, you want to have, you want to make it as historically accurate as possible. They were probably even more accurate. They were, everything had to have a justification for why you were doing it in this way. Their attention to detail was painstaking. They created bound buttonholes and covered bu buttons, which is very much outside of the work of what theater people do. You know, when you're doing a theater, I need to see it from 50 feet away. I don't need to see it you know, at scene level. When you're in a museum exhibit, and this was true when the exhibit was here, and it's certainly true in New York, people go up and they look at it like this. And they see every single seam and how those buttons are connected, and, and they want to know. And so it's a very different process for them. Something you'll never see in the exhibit itself, you know, she uses armpit protectors because clearly no woman in the 1930s would have had a dress without an armpit protector. But no one's going to see those armpit protectors. Jessica's attention to detail was unsurpassed. For each dress, they created at least two mock-ups uh, to test their theories. You know, would the blue coat require an extra dart? 
would the diamond inset use that different fabric? As I said, they decided to ruche it, which means that they're, it's pleating the fabric as a decoration on the garment to provide that triangular, that, that squished effect. One of the things that when we started, we anticipated that with the printed fabrics, they would find something similar to the printed fabrics, and that would be enough. That would be close enough to get the sense of this. But for them, that wasn't going to fulfill the vision of Hetty. And they really thought of her as being on site with them. They were constantly, in the way that I refer to Hedviga, Hedviga as this you know, element part of the exhibit, they also had this sense of her as being part of their process. So they decided, they turned it over to their soft props artisan. And this is where we hope technology works, because if it does, it'll be great. But if not, you have this lovely picture of what she's doing. And she painstakingly hand uh, drew silk screens and, and created silk screens for each of the fabrics. And went in, you know, for this one, this is the blue and red and black print fabric. She had to actually end up all of those black little, um, I guess they're kind of clover leaf shapes. She ended up actually hand painting those in because the screen wasn't working appropriately. She did yards upon yards of this, and then she screened in the colors. And hopefully, I can show you what this work says. We'll see. It was working, and then it wasn't working. You know, technology is fun. And now I can't even find my cursor. Come on, cursor. You know what? We might play with this later to see if we can do it. But oh, that's even worse. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's awesome. Hi, everyone. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and then, I don't know, she's not living anymore. He wrote, by the way, here's how he got the number. He wrote the exact same academic that I had written, finding the same appendix that I had found. And when the slide comes up, which it will, I'll show you his email to her, which is in beautiful German. Really excellent. I'm sure it's excellent German because Tyler is super fastidious. Um, and maybe in three years, she organized her system. Or maybe she trusted a request that was written in German more. But for whatever reason, she gave him Brigitte's number and address. And actually, I have her response in the presentation as well. Oh. Tyler called her at our request and we followed up and we discovered the following things about Brigitte. One, she has an unbelievable memory. She left Prague in 1939 on one of Nicholas Winton's kinder transports as an eight-year-old. And she's on actually one of the last transports out of Prague. And her English, as someone who was in England during the war, is impeccable. <laughs> so we knew that this was, you know, it made for a very interesting... Erin uh, Bowright, everyone. Um, so we sent Tyler to interview to Nuremberg to interview Brigitte. And there we got to meet our designer. Here is what he learned and shared with us. Remember, we are asking an 80-year-old woman to recall salient details, not about her mother or father, but about an aunt and uncle who she hadn't seen for over 70 years. Just imagine how you would do with this task. Can you come up with anything more? They were good people. I liked them. They lived on a farm. You know, those sorts of very basic, I'm 34 and I'm struggling with this assignment. Here were the things that she was able to give us that totally changed the nature of what we were doing with this exhibit. One, she was never called Hedvika, but Hedvig or Hedy. The family was much more German in their orientation, and like many Jews of Czechoslovakia, which had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as the empire at the end of the 19th century started relaxing its laws, Jews gravitated towards German and German culture as a way to elevate their status. And Paul and Hetty's families would have been part of this experience. Do you want to move my presentation off of the flash drive onto the desktop? Because that actually might make it a little more secure. Not to stage manage while I'm stage managing. <laughs> <laughs> but they're used to it. Um, she had red hair. And for those of us who've just seen that black and white photo for so long, someone with red hair, all of us know redheads in our lives, and it gives a really different sense of a person. That you're like, oh, she's a redhead. You know, that this is, there's something vibrant there. There is something about that coloring that just totally, you know, gave us this sense of, you know, who is this saucy lady who's looking at us? 
She owned her own shop, and there were people who worked for her. Brigitte remembered as a child going into the shop and buying, and, and the, the people who worked for her aunt would make her doll clothes and puppets, and this had been one of our driving questions. You know, is, was Paul counting on her home talent, or was this someone who was a professional? And this was a way of kind of getting some sort of reinforcement, that this is a professional who had her own business and had her own professional life. Um, she, this, uh, Brigitte, you know, helped us better understand Hetty in the context of the breadth of the Jewish experience and especially the Jewish female experience in Czechoslovakia, which had been part of a very active garment industry in Europe, which many of the workers were Jewish. And this industry was decimated in the Holocaust. So it gave us yet another way of looking at that story. They were jolly people. They were always laughing. That's where we are, yeah. Everyone, Jay Hyland, Molly Dubin, Chad Michaels, <laughs> So let's go back just a little bit, and I'm going to show you, uh, maybe, this, this is Tyler's letter that he wrote, for those of you who read German. You have a beautiful sense of what he might be saying. I have no idea. Um, I can read, yeah. Um, and this, if it wants to. Um, Jay, I think you turned it off of the actual presentation and into the slideshow. Um, Sorry. No worries. Uh, yeah, you can see some words that are like, you know, Der Humboldt University, Zuberlin, you know. And he's, he's an American. He's an American. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I'm pretty sure he probably spent, just knowing him, he probably spent a lot of time putting this in just right, just so. He is a just so sort of guy. They were jolly people, they were always laughing. Let me know when you get it back up to where it's the presentation mode, not the, okay. And I'll keep going and I'll come back. Several months after Brigitte met <coughs> with Tyler, she sent us a letter that Paul Stranod had written to her father. And when you asked the letter about, did you get all this information from one letter, suddenly we had another source of primary information. This letter was in German, and so we had to wait until Tyler, our resident German expert, had time to translate it. One of the things that I had no, you know, th this letter is dated February 1939, so 10 months before our original letter. And it details all of the things that have happened to the family. It is a much more open letter. It's a very confusing letter because we found that lots of the family members have similar names. So you have another Paul in the family, there's another Hedvig, and it's incredibly confusing. You had to, we actually had Jane Abner, who was working with us on this project, annotate everything in the letter so we had better understanding what was going on. And it talks about the loss of property, the loss of work, attempts to escape, contacts with American family, not just um, Alvin Strunod, but his sister Mildred as well, and their uncle Ben. A lot of different contexts are going on. And the separation already by February of 1939 from Brigitte's family, who are living in the Sudetenland, um, which was already under Nazi occupation. And by about a month later, all of Czechoslovakia was either allied or, um, or under Nazi occupation. So the Holocaust story in Czechoslovakia is very different. And I think that this exhibit gives us a way of exploring that. Um, at the bottom of this letter, there was a short dashed off note, and it said, love to your children, and it was signed Hetty. And I hadn't even noticed this because I couldn't read German, so I didn't even look to the end of the letter. I'm like, well, I'll just wait to, and Tyler was like, hey, did you notice that at the bottom, Hetty wrote a note? And I was like, nope, no idea, but there it was. And do you want me to take this on, or you? I feel like this I can do. No, no, no. Here. There. Uh -huh. Ta da. So, this is what. For, so, this was literally, I think, three days after I sent Tyler the assignment, and this is the response he got from the same lady. Look at that. Best Iris. I'm glad to be of help with your project and wish you luck. The address I have is blank. Best, Iris. So there you go. This is so. Here is why you know. For me, it's always like learn a different foreign language, people, because clearly there's a reason for it. 
Um, and this is this new letter in German, and this is the bottom where it's signed. You can see, I always think there's this sense of, of look at Paul's very orderly handwriting versus Hetty's, you know, creative style, you know, that it gives you a different sense of her as well, just seeing her handwriting. And this is where we are at this point. The rep took that and they created a label of her work. So every single garment is identified as her creation and really took it to this other level of saying, you know, it, this is not just a work of memory, but this is her work and we want to give name to her work. Um, the Museum of Jewish Heritage actually took this to the next level and one of the pictures you'll see at the end is they took this signature and they actually put it on a wall in the exhibit which really I think is also giving even more of that sense of we are honoring this woman and here's what she accomplished. And we continue with our pro process. We were getting panels together, our catalog ready, um, and everything was mostly done. When in July, we got a call from Karen Strenad. Karen Strenad is Burton Strenad, the person who found the letters, granddaughter, daughter, daughter. She's Alvin Strenad's granddaughter. And she was getting ready for an interview with PBS NewsHour. She had stumbled across in a family album more images of the Strenads in Europe. And also, well, this is one of those pictures. This is our last minute discovery. This is a picture. This set, Paul is in the center of this picture right here. You can see it's a beautiful family photo. And this is his four sisters. This is his mother and his father. Um, and this picture is probably, he was born, it's probably like the early part of the 20th century. And what I can tell you is by 1945, not one of these people was still living. Um, the mother had died before in 1935 of some sort of natural causes, but everyone else was murdered in the Holocaust. And so this was really a way of showing that story and getting a better sense of that on one hand. The other thing that she found was yet another letter. And this is one of those things, if you think about research, this was like the magic bullet of our research. Because so many of those questions, we went from having a letter that was dated December 1939 to one that was 14 months before October 24th, 1938. Um, and this is, uh, I, I, this is right after the Munich Agreement is signed, and whereas my first letter is so quiet in its desperation and is so subtle, this one is loud and screaming. Um, and it reinforces some of the things that we had already suspected from our first letter. One, that they were familiar, Paul and Alvin, that he talks again about stamps and stamp collecting, that he, you know, that this wasn't this distant relationship. Two, in this very short time, we're talking less than a month, how their family's life has been affected. His father had already been voiced forced to vacate his business in the Sudetenland and had moved in with Paul and Hetty. Um, and he was able to confirm the, the talk that um, Brigitte had given us about the professional life of Hetty and actually his own. He was a banker and he talks about that in this letter. Um, and he says, you know, that his wife has owned a fine dressmaking establishment for the last 17 years and has several work people and is known for being, having fine taste and is very diligent. He's also very prescient. He sees that this is not the end, the Sudetenland and, and the Munich Agreement, but this is the beginning. He says here, an unwanted consequence of these events will be that the influence of Germany will greatly increase in this country. And you can imagine what this will mean to us Jews living here and how it will threaten our means of livelihood. Even now, strong anti-Semitic tendencies are making nothing will remain therefore to do but to adapt oneself to the circumstances and to consider immigrating from Europe. In light of this letter, we had to change our entire narrative. Which, when you're a month and a half out from an exhibit, you're kind of like, oh, oh gosh, how do we do this? You know, because instead of being a last desperate attempt, that this is a guy who saw the writing on the wall very early and started making uh, connections, and then the question is, well, why couldn't they get out? Um, and, and, and so being able to give even more information about the high barrier to immigration in the U.S. at that time was incredibly important. We had started on that process, but now we could really talk about how, you know, in 1938, he's contacting family and he can't get into there. We know that by 1941, he had submitted documents to the U.S. Um, immigration <laughs> services and he wasn't, you know, that they just never came together. 
In New York, actually, this was especially meaningful because they had recently, in the last three years, had an exhibit called Against All Odds, so I was able to connect to that exhibit and, and talk about that as well. And for us, there was this sense of being able to connect all of this with the opening at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which stands directly across from the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. So you see this amazing visual of here are these icons of immigration, and this is a story of thwarted hope and promise, and how these two things can come together. These dresses, as a stand-in for Hetty herself, were finally able to reach this destination. One of our humanity scholars, and we had a team that created the catalog, uh, which is available for sale upstairs, <laughs> Rachel Baum, a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, summed up stitching histories as follows. We have only strands of the life of the dressmaker Hedvig Strenad. Yet if you take the letters of Strand and rearrange them, you find Strenad. This is a work of memory, taking threads and stitching them together to give shape to what was lost and stitching that further into our lives. The exhibit on Hedwig and Paul invite visitors to debate the meaning and interpretations of the artifacts, to consider what it means to remember the Holocaust, and ultimately to be changed by this connection with one of the millions of people unknown, one of the millions of unknown lives lost in the Shoah. And for us, this became, this is you know something that I think was our kind of driving force as we created this exhibit and what we were hoping. And now as it travels, something that we hope other people will take with them as well. I wanted to give you a couple of images of what it looks like in New York. There you can see the heady signature behind the silver dress. And it looks very different in New York. New York is a much bigger space. It's more gallery. Uh, I would say it's a uh, salon style. Ours was very intimate and had this sense of you were almost um, eavesdropping in on conversations, and here you have the sense of grandeur that I don't know that you got. Both are very lovely, but it's not. It's just a very different feeling. Um, again, this is one of our dresses in conversation with these wall panels we created to show them in a context. This was some an innovation in New York that I thought was so smart. They took, we had had like a little touch book that I would run in when we have groups and run out so it wouldn't walk anywhere. And it was this constant battle and the docents were like, where is the touch book? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, docents are like, yes, we, we know this struggle. Um, but they took the uh, pieces that we had and they actually affixed them to the wall and you can go in and it says, touch me. Because all over on all of the dresses it says, do not touch, do not touch, do not touch. And I can tell you they're there are people who anytime they see a fabric exhibit want to go in and, and paw it. So this gives a great way of pushing that motivation into an actual uh, touch site. So I think we're going to encourage future locations to do something similar. Um, and this also just gives you a sense of just how big that hall is and, and how it's in conversation. They actually have our intro video on that first opening wall as you walk in. This is what we hope that Rachel Baum's message is what we hope you, we t you took with you when you saw this exhibit and hearing this lecture and seeing our Emmy Award winning production from the arts page. When Bert Trinod started this process and discovered this photograph, I don't think he would have anticipated the exhibit, but for us the unintended consequences of the exhibit are really the most amazing part. The exhibit connected Brigitte Trinod uh, Brigida, sorry, Rochek, with her American family, family that she didn't even know existed. Separately, at our opening here, 17 members of the extended American Strenaud family had a reunion, many of whom had never met before and now are in context. Some of them are talking about going on a trip to Prague with Karen and, and seeing all of the family landmarks, as it were. The exhibit was so much more than contract work for a rep team. No one on this team was Jewish, but they felt deeply connected to Hetty's work and vision. To prep for the exhibit travel, Molly took the dresses back to the rep to be steamed. And one of our team members, Alex Tacoma, exclaimed, you brought my babies back to me. <laughs> like, that is, they feel the same <coughs> emotional connection to this. Tiff Pua, upon winning her Emmy, dedicated it to H Hetty and her work. And Tyler Grasse, our intrepid intern, recently wrote up his experience working on this exhibit for Hillel International's magazine. And here's his statement. And I just thought it was so amazing I had to share it with you. I had the dream of, of a museum professional, helping rediscover the life, I had the dream of a museum professional, helping rediscover the life of an individual lost to the Shoah, and conducting an oral history interview that would become an integral part of a traveling exhibit. Yet I could not shake an unsettling feeling in my gut. 
I was disturbed that she or any aspect of her story had been forgotten. I realized that every person is a story, unique in its telling. In a sense, I felt that this story would both live on through me and through the work I would later help produce. On the train ride home, I realized how wrong I had been to believe my Jewishness was an obstacle to my becoming a museum professional. A thing to see now that while I'm Jew... Oh, sorry, a thing to be avoided. I see now that while Judaism at the, is at the forefront of every decision I will make, it will always be present in my work and my, and my passion, guiding me in ways that both seen and unseen. We wanted this exhibit to provide information about one person, a couple, a family, who was lost in the Holocaust. But we know there is so much more to discover. We were not able to find out information about Hedvig's immediate family, and there are way more mysteries to be solved. Each time this city moves to a new city, now in New York, then in Madison, then in Miami, and who knows where else it will go. We'd love some help connecting there. We hope to add to our narratives, and more than that, that people will use this as a jumping off point to discover more stories. You all are now part of this continuum. Some of you have been for a while. And we will keep you posted on the new ripples and reverberations it creates. Thank you very much. Could you go back and show us where the fabric she was working on? Sure. Since it closed down in the middle of that? For sure. <coughs> Bear with me here. They had all the other letters posted where the exhibit didn't they? The exhibit, the changing exhibit had didn't have the German letter posted. It did have the one from uh, 1938. And right now, one of the things we're working on is we have a team from Cardinal Stritch that has designed a kiosk that will go into the permanent exhibit so we can then put that up there too. Okay, I guess that's why I thought there were more of their letters. So this is, oh, here actually, that's the one. So this is the fabric as it was produced. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing here, the black lines were all hand drawn. And we're talking about huge numbers of yards because she had to do a silk lining, a raw silk uh, material as well. And then uh, there were a couple of different, and so when you're doing two different types of fabrics, the, the chemical process is different for each one of these. It's a whole thing. Melissa and I had the privilege of going and, and videotaping this, and it was insane. You're watching, she's, first of all, you have to figure out all of the math behind how you take a tiny picture and then create fabric, one. Two, you're taking that and you're making one screen that then has to be divided up into however many screens, you know, each color is a different screen. And so after she figured out the black wasn't screening through appropriately, she hand drew that and then did two screens of the red and the blue, but had to know, I want this blue on this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and where the, that color should go, and where the, how that screen should be cut. And then she goes through on a pass, and you come, we would get, she was counting each time, I think each pass it was, the, the ink was like 10 times, and, and then you have to divide up.